Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Eileen Doherty, and I'm the director of the Colorado Gerontological Society. And I would like to welcome you all to the session this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> in this session, we are continuing with our Aging in Place series. Um, this one is going to deal with keeping a dementia family member in your home and looking at some of the types of supports that you can provide to make that successful. Um, <clears throat> a copy of the slides in the PowerPoint will be emailed to everyone after um, the presentation today. So feel free to um, just um, take pictures if you want, but you will also get a copy of it in your, um, in your email later today. Um, the other thing is that this is uh, one in a number of different sessions that we have done on aging in place, and those are all at our YouTube channel. Um, so if you just Google Colorado Gerontological Society and YouTube, um, that playlist is there for your review and convenience. So starting out this afternoon, let's talk a little bit about some basics, um, some things that you can do in your own um, home, your attitude, how you can approach uh, keeping a, a family member with dementia in your own home. The most important thing is probably to take care of yourself. And one of the ways that you can take care of yourself is to surround yourself with family and friends who are actually supportive and consistent, and these people can provide you, excuse me, the help that you need in terms of continuing your journey through um, keeping a loved one with dementia in your own home. Consistency is probably the most important thing. Uh, daily routines help not only you yourself, but help the older adult to begin to know exactly what to expect. Even though they may not be able to tell time, they may not may be disoriented to other things in the surroundings, the more consistent and the more routinized that you can keep things, the better. So things like sleep um, patterns, you know, if you've always gone to bed at 10 o'clock at night, if you've always watched the news before you go to bed, stay with that routine. Um, diet and exercise tend to be very, very important and one of the most important things for many older adults, especially early in their journey with dementia, is exercise is important. Going outside for walks, uh, being able to engage in stretching exercises, um, being actively involved as much as possible is um, very significant in helping to keep that individual uh, <clears throat> in a position where they are able to be mobile and able to transfer and be as independent as possible. Other things that you want to really focus on is memory engagement, understanding that short term memory is the first to go. And as you go through this journey, long term memory is the last to go. Um, what I have personally found most um, difficult is when a loved one no longer recognizes me. Um, I have been able to carry many people through this journey, but it gets very, very hard when they no longer know who you are. And then engaging them in as much socialization as possible. But again, being very careful about how you do that because too much noise, too much change, too many people can cause more confusion and um, frustration than it can actually be beneficial. So an example, about three years before my aunt died, it became very clear to me that Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner at our house was much too confusing because there were multiple children, grandchildren, um, other guests in our home, and just even the lights and the present giving was more than she could manage. So as time went on, my husband and I learned that it was a better alternative to visit her in her surroundings when it was just the two of us and it was much more quiet. 
One of the things also to do is to set realistic goals and to prioritize tasks. Um, sometimes we think we need to get things done and it may or may not be as important. Calendars and checklists can also help us. Um, they can help the elder adult who is de um, experiencing dementia, um, as well as they can help you to see what things you either have done or have not done. Um, change is going to be an extremely important thing, and you're going to have to be very nimble through this process in terms of <clears throat> making changes very quickly, uh, making having the ability to meet the demands that are of the moment. So in terms of getting your home ready, tour your home with kind of a compromised viewpoint. And what we mean by this is think of this room or think of your home as how it will appear, if you will, to someone who has difficulties with dementia, especially in the areas of cognition, of depth perception, balance, coordination, memory, and strength. So these kinds of things, think about what that means as the person, as you are going through your home and doing this um, tour. Instructions are um, oftentimes very difficult for people to follow because again, they may require multi-step directions. So simplifying your life uh, <clears throat> is very important, allowing people then to make those decisions as they walk through the home or as they live there with, a, with less ability to make decisions. Another thing that's very important is that people who have dementia are going to take more time to be able to adjust to changes in the environment. I sometimes give the example when I'm working with assisted living or retirement uh, communities that the activities director, while that person can be your best friend, they can also be your worst enemy because their job in a facility is often to put up lights, to put up decorations, to change things around, to have music, to have things going on for engagement. And what we know is that sometimes for dementia residents, that can actually be very difficult. So if you find yourself needing to redecorate, to put up different, to move things around in your home, make sure that you do it slowly and so the individual has the time and ability to adapt to that change. One of the other things that we suggest is that you think of yourself about simplifying this home environment. Think minimalist and what do you need? What does that individual need? And what do they need access to? So a really big thing might be if you have a four bedroom home, for example, can you just close off some of the rooms such that the individual only has one or two or three rooms that they um, are active in? Because again, that reduces the area that they have to um, become familiar with each time they enter a new environment. In addition to that, think about and look at the environment itself. Some of the suggestions in this particular slide talk very specifically about decorations and what you have on the walls, and others talk more specifically about floors and safety issues. So another thing to look at is do you have busy wallpaper or do you have murals on your walls? Do you have a lot of pictures that may be either um, bring back good memories or they may be bring back not so good memories? So looking at the walls and what types of things those may elicit. Wall mirrors have long been known in the dementia world to increase um, a person's sense of confusion. Um, and fear and anxiety because they are unable, again, to process or um, decipher what is real and what is a reflection. 
So I have actually seen people try to follow a reflection in a mirror. And I actually saw one person break a mirror because they were attempting to actually get to that person to stop them. So wall mirrors can be very disruptive. Bookshelves can easily be um, secured to the wall. Um, again, not that somebody might do this on a regular day, but again, if they were confused, they might try to pull them down. They might try to climb on them as stairs. So again, removing that hazard just creates more safety in your home. Swivel chairs sometimes can provide can prove to be also difficult because people will lose their balance or as they go to sit down, the chair moves and then they lose the ability to hold it steady. Carpets are oftentimes things that we want to avoid at most costs. Um, curled edges can cause people to stumble again because we're not looking. We didn't perceive that the carpet uh, corner was rolled up or that there was a throw rug there. So as we shuffle, we end up um, losing our balance or um, falling on those kinds of things. Um, we do suggest sometimes that if you have stairs, you may want to put a very bright colored carpet at the bottom of the stairs or at the top of the stairs. Again, this can cause the individual the ability to stop and to reassess the situation um, that then can help them to re, um, reset, if you will, um, and grab for a bar or not even go down or go up those stairs. Another thing that people need to be really aware of in terms of um, working or looking at your home is what else can cause stumbling blocks? What could cause somebody to fall? So if your floors are not clean, if they're cluttered, if you have footstools, if you have end tables, anything like that can cause people to um, be unsafe in the home. As you're looking around your bathroom, this is not necessarily some of things um, are just general safety things, but some you may want to implement as your loved one um, goes down their journey of dementia. So elevated toilet seats, non-slip mats in the bathtub and grab bars, those tend to be relatively standard items that many of us have in our bathroom. We have them there just because as we get older, they become important. And even things like non-slip mats are important for someone who is not older. But two other things that might be very important is um, most bathrooms have a lock on the door. Um, and locks are while good, may you may want to consider taking them off. And the reason being because the individual can either lock themselves in or they will lock themselves out and then they don't have the ability to figure out or follow directions, even as you are talking with them through the door to unlock the door. Again, I've not witnessed this, but I've definitely heard people tell me that they had to contact like the fire department or other family members to gain access to a bathroom through an outside window just to be able to unlock the door. Outlets are very important. Again, this is city code and building code in most buildings. So if you have updated your home, um, most of your outlets will be grounded. Uh, with a false circuit interrupter. That is the little red button that you may see on uh, <clears throat> various um, outlets that you have throughout your home. What happens with that is if there is water that gets near that outlet, then the electricity automatically shuts off. Again, another good safety precaution for all of us, but something you may, you will want to review and consider replacing all of those in your home. And they're not terribly expensive to replace. This next one is again, older adults as they go down this dementia journey, sometimes they're unable to tell 
um, hot from cold. And so they may scald themselves if the temperature is too warm. So they have various kinds of devices that can be um, installed. One is to just set your hot water heater at 120 degrees, which is the recommended amount, and then to um, secure that area so no one can change the temperature. Um, there are also different types of um, devices. So for example, our bathtub has a device um, on it where if someone flushes the toilet in the house, you do not get scalded, but it's like a modulator, keeping the temperature at the same temperature that you set it while you're taking a shower, even if someone uses um, hot water someplace else in the in a um, washing room, a laundry room, uh, the dishwasher is running or whatever. Um, another thing to look at is what things you have and keep in your bathroom. So if you have lotions, mouthwash, perfumes, often people will report that these are things that, again, your loved one on their journey may try to consume these things. They will try to drink them. They don't really have the ability to sort out, if you will, that these are items that um, are toxic um, and maybe even in some instances poisonous. Cleaning supplies, whether they are stored in your kitchen, whether they're stored in a linen closet, whether they're stored in a garage, all of those need to be put under lock and key um, as you go through this journey. And don't wait for a bad accident to happen. Again, be proactive about this and secure these things in some type of a closet or a cupboard or a locked um, garage, a locked bedroom, whatever. <clears throat> Another thing to look around in your bathroom is whether or not there are any type of razors, hair curling irons, hair dryers, any of those small appliances that many of us have in our bedroom, or I mean in our bathroom, that again, the older adult could use and could harm themselves. Um, <clears throat> another thing that is suggested um, as a possibility is using some type of tape or colored um, toilet seat to help an older adult recognize the toilet and the shower. So then let's move a little bit to the bedroom. Consider locking your bedroom door so that you can keep personal and dangerous items out of your uh, loved one's reach. Um, if, you, if your loved one has a separate bedroom, again, go back to the minimalist idea and remove any of those items that might cause confusion. Um, leave very minimal things in the room so that the individual does not have to um, sort out, whether it's pictures, mirrors, dressers, um, those kinds of things, put as minimal amount of those in as you as possible. Um, take the lock off the door, same reason it was for the bathroom. Um, <clears throat> and other things that you could do is if you have, um, if your loved one sleeps in a different room than you do, uh, consider doing audio monitors. Again, these are the kinds of things that can help you know from a technological perspective uh, what, it, what the individual is doing, and you can be more um, tuned in to helping them. Or if they're calling for help, you can also hear their um, calls or cries for assistance. Clothing, sometimes many of us have way too much clothes. So again, reducing or taking out all but four or five sets of closing, clothes can help with re, um, the choices that an individual has to make so that there's not as many items that they need to, uh, that they look at and then get again, overwhelmed. A kitchen, kitchens have lots of things that are very dangerous for people who are on an Alzheimer's or dementia journey. Um, water faucets, again, do temperature controlled water faucets, same basic ideas in the bathroom. Um, look at what kinds of devices that you might be able to install uh, <clears throat> On, with a stove, for example, that might turn off after a period of time. Or like I have a coffee pot 
that after two hours, if no one has moved um, the carafe, then the coffee pot shuts off. Um, some of my other kitchen appliances have what I would call a two-step um, process. So for example, my toaster these days and my food processor, you can't start them unless you actually latch the lid or whatever, and then you have to press the start button. Those types of multi-step processes can be a safety precaution for, again, a dementia family member because they often will not remember to do both steps. So they'll plug it in and they'll think it should work, but then they haven't tightened or uh, secured the lock the item. Um, <clears throat> other things to look at in the kitchen is you may need to unplug your microwave and your stove when you are not using them. Again, not necessarily the most optimum thing in the world, but might be something that you have to do. Or on your stove, you may need to place um, items that um, like covers over the dials that make it difficult for the individual to turn them. Food should always be within easy reach, uh, but make sure again that there is not um, any moldy food that what you have and that's easy to reach and eat is nutritious. And at the same time, that they don't have to crawl on any chairs or stools or anything like that to get out food. Um, this one is good for all of us, which is regular checks at the smoke detectors and the fire extinguishers, making sure that those are also in a safe place. Um, knives and other electrical appliances, we highly suggest um, that those actually also be stored in some type of a cabinet that has a childproof lock. Um, for example, one of my, my blender has a very sharp uh, blade on it. Let's move then to the living room. Um, one thing that might be very good for an older adult is to begin to use lift out chairs. This can be helpful just in terms of people, again, not losing their balance or falling. Um, it may take some patterning for them to use the uh, remote control. Um, so maybe buying one of those sooner when they are in their um, dementia journey as opposed to later so that those patterns and the ability to learn to use that becomes a little bit easier in their, um, as they lose memory and ability to remember things. Make the space in your living room easy to walk around and to move in. Many of us have what I would call lots of stumbling blocks. We have end tables and we have coffee tables and we have footstools and we have um, racks that have um, blankets on them. Um, anything like that will again, um, those just cause opportunities for people to um, fall, to trip, and to um, hurt themselves. Lighting is extremely important. Um, again, a living room, sometimes um, my living room, for example, does not have an overhead light. Um, back in the late 40s when my house was built, they didn't put a um, overhead light in the living room. So I have to rely totally on floor lamps. Um, one of the things, instead of relying on floor lamps, um, if I should reach this point in my life, is I probably will install lighting that is wall mounted or ceiling mounted. So that again, I don't have things on the floor that could, that could be a trip hazard. The living room is often a place that you can uh, create as a comfort zone, um, using pictures of family, um, using uh, the audio or not audio, the video picture frames, um, leaving uh, picture books of family events around. Those kinds of things can create great memories and it can be an area of comfort and um, solace for an individual. Another thing that we want you to look at, so as you have looked kind of around each individual house or each individual room in your house, 
then think also about other safety features that you may want to install. So reflector tape, carpets, anything on stairs, floors, and walls to really outline where people are going. So um, whether you put that on the floor, whether you put that on the wall, so it's eye height, again, trying to keep the person oriented to where they are and where they want to go. To also create those patterns that if those um, pathways no longer exist, that the person stops and turns around. Handrails in hallways and stairwells should be a must in everybody's home, but again, I know that they not always are. Glass doors onto patios can be just about as confusing for older adults as um, mirrors because the individual does not necessarily process that this is a glass door. So they will start walking or even sometimes running toward a glass door, think they are going to be able to go out and then um, the door and then they walk through the glass, the plate glass, and then they get hurt. So again, think about what are some ways that you could create um, cues, um, whether you put stickers on the door, whether you put tape across the glass doors, anything again to create a sense that this is a door that they must stop, that's something you know that they need to turn around. Doors you'll find, um, whether the front door, the back door, doors to the basement, doors to the garage, most of the time you are going to want to keep all of those locked. And again, um, whether you want to lock those with the safety code um, and get those where you push in a, a code or whether you want to use a key that you keep safe as the dementia goes on, um, people may be able to, again, not recognize a turnkey or a turn knob, so you may need to have a key. So again, think through what is the safest way for you to keep doors locked, to keep the individual safe, but also in case of a fire or in case somebody needs to gain access to your home or to those doors, that they are able to do that. You're gonna find that you're sharing if you do any type of a door lock with a code, you'll want to share those as much as possible with people who need to know, including putting those codes um, in a place where you know fire and other rescue can get in if need be. Uh, fire and rescue have no problem. If they're needed, they will just take a hatchet and break through your door. And sometimes that's okay as well. Similarly, um, going or access out into the yard, um, you will want to secure both the front and back gates or any types of entryways. Um, you probably can get by with a padlock, um, especially um, then the person, if they're not inclined to climb up and over, a padlock probably will be okay because that's the kind of thing that the individual would have to have a key to be able to unlock. Other options are to use like sliding bolts um, on doors that may require the person, again, to be able to have the strength to move that bolt back and forth um, and can, again, very oftentimes be easily um, opened from the other side. But at the same time that we're increasing these safety features, if you will, in terms of doors and gates and those kinds of things, we also want to leave inside the house as open as we can because we want the individual to be able to move about. We want to encourage them to move about. So we want them to be able to get up off their chair, to go to the kitchen, to get a glass of water. We want them to be able to go to the bathroom as in independently as long as possible so that they maintain that sense of independence. Another set of safety tips, which I have already um, alluded to some, is finding some type of a locked storage area for any of these types of toxic chemicals and materials, whether it's cleaning supplies, mothballs, insecticides, um, sharp knives, cutting, uh, cutting devices, anything like that. 
Um, you can also oftentimes either secure those with a key combination locks or with child-proof doorknobs or cabinet locks. The yard, as I mentioned, um, is a place where we want the older adult to be able to wander freely. Um, we do want, as part of our safety measures, to keep an eye out if the, if the individual goes into the yard. Um, so we have line of sight, um, oversight and supervision, but they should be allowed to go out you know, and sit on the patio or to walk around and look at the flowers or, or whatever you might have available. Again, though, look around the yard and see what kinds of things might be safety hazards. So make sure that the walkways in your patios are clean. Um, take the leaves off, take the snow off, take the ice. Um, you might want to install a down sidewalks and things, handrails, um, put handrails as well on stairwell, stair, um, stair steps if you have them. Again, shovels, many of us keep a shovel by our back door um, in the winter time so we can be able to grab that easily should there be a winter storm that we need to um, shovel the snow from our backyard our back door or our front doors. So again, securing that in such a way that the individual does not fall over it. I personally am a really big believer in technology. Um, I think technology is one of the things that can help us in many, many ways to keep an older um, dementia uh, relative in our own homes. So technology like seat cushions, floor mats, bed pans, anything that can be bed pads that be con connected to a phone or has some type of an alert system um, that can let you know when your loved one is moving around so that again, you know that something that they're safe. Um, and if they have been unsafe in those areas that you have the ability to take a step or two into that room and help and observe and make sure that they are in fact safe. Motion sensors and motion detectors are another safety device that can be um, managed, um, whether you're using these alarms outdoors, in your bedrooms, other rooms. Again, it's, it's your choice, but these can be very beneficial, again, at, at taking some of the burden and the pressure off of you having to constantly be in the same room or the same perimeter as the older adult. Um, <clears throat> video monitors can also help. Um, again, you need to be careful about where you install the, the uh, cameras. The cameras are easy to install. It's where do you put the video monitors so that you can actually observe the behavior. You can get apps to put those on your uh, phone as well. Having video monitors and alarms that make noise can often serve as being very disruptive and frustrating to an older adult. So again, if that can be connected to your iPhone, that is great. Um, lighting and color contrast are have also been deemed to be very important. Uh, in terms of your um, home environment as you are working with an older adult on their dementia journey. So you will want strong but very low glare lights um, and sensor night lights are also something that can help with visual perception and coordination. Um, glare is extremely important because again, oftentimes the older adult is not able to sort out whether that's glare and to move appropriately so that they move out of um, the glare on say the morning sun comes in on a picture frame. Um, so that kind of glare may then cause them to lose balance or become disoriented. Your lighting, take a good look at your lighting and see what types of shadows are created both by natural light from the sun, by your blinds or whatever window coverings you have, as well as the lights. Shadows can be extremely disruptive, as again, the older adult may not be able to differentiate what a shadow is versus not, and they may, try, they may get fearful, 
They may try to walk toward the shadow. Um, they may walk off, you know, an edge. They may walk into something as they're trying to follow that shadow. The new LED lights are a really big improvement, especially the bright white ones in terms of um, the uh, lighting in your home. Light colors on the walls are a good thing as opposed and then having dark backgrounds to create um, create contrast is good. Um, having light on light, again, the individual may not be able to create that depth or create that um, change. And so their depth perception may be off. So it gives again a visual cue. Bright patterns, um, they may lead to overstimulation. Bright colors are good, but by bright patterns may not be so good. And those can sometimes even lead to hallucinations and delusions. Other safety concerns in your home is make sure that your refrigerator um, is well stocked with food that is fresh, that can be safely eaten cold. Um, make sure that none of it is spoiled or expired or raw or moldy. Um, so I personally try to make a habit that once a week I go into the refrigerator, whether it needs it or not, and throw out any leftovers or anything that may have got pushed to the back of the shelves and is not readily in my um, line of sight. Um, you may also want to put things like condiments, like ketchups and mustard and those kinds of things in a second refrigerator that is locked because again, we don't really want um, your loved one to eat a whole bottle of ketchup tonight. Um, it's okay if they eat one or two apples, but don't leave 10 apples sitting on your kitchen counter. Um, these are all adjustments that you will need to make. Um, pet bowls. Sometimes we hear of older adults who, um, again, get confused about the pet bowls. And we have heard of them, of individuals uh, using the dog's bowl, um, either as their own bowl, as they put something in it um, that they have um, got for themselves to eat, or if there is food left over in the pet bowls, we have also heard of situations where the pets or where the individual has tried to eat the, the uh, dog's food or the cat's food. Um, looking around also at your kitchen, uh, look at how easy is it to turn on your garbage disposal. For example, my garbage disposal, you actually have to open a kitchen cabinet and then you have to remember where it's at and you have to turn it on. Others, the garbage disposal switch is, you know, on the kitchen counter. Um, again, what can you do to, even if the garbage disposal gets turned on, I keep a strainer in my kitchen sink so that things don't fall into um, the garbage disposal. So even if it gets turned on, um, it also then has to break or somebody has to remove that strainer. Look at things, especially electric stove tops. Um, as many of you probably know, an electric stove top can stay warm for quite a long period of time after you turn it off. Again, be trying to be cautious and making sure that as after it turns off, after you turn it off, that the individual does not get, go close and gets burned. Gas fireplaces also are another hazard that some of us have started to install, um, either a gas one or an electric one. Again, either turning on the gas or turning on the electricity. Those can also be um, areas of bur uh, where burns can happen easily. Car keys, the old car key problem. Car keys should never, ever, ever be left anywhere where an older adult who has dementia can have access to them. Um, the person, again, will not be able to exercise judgment um, and they will, uh, they may try to use it because, again, they probably have been driving for 50, 60, 70 years and it's a very natural part of what they do. Uh, <clears throat> 
And obviously we have state laws about locking up firearms, but again, all firearms should be locked up or even removed from the property. Other things that you can do is use memory aids. <clears throat> so using words or pictures to create cues and help to jog the memory. So if you um, have pictures on the wall, say for example, of the family, and the individual can't remember who they are, but they maybe know the family members, put um, a little label underneath the uh, picture or in the corner of the picture with the names of the individuals. Um, label things that are inside cupboards, cabinets, the refrigerators, again, so that uh, the person can read what's in there. Um, and they can then, if they have the ability to read, then it triggers a memory and they're not looking endlessly for an item that they thought was in the kitchen, but they're in the wrong door, drawer, or the wrong cabinet. Um, block lettering is often said to be better than some other types of printing, again, because it's bold and the individual has um, a better sense of the um, ability to, to uh, recognize those words and to interpret what they mean. As I said a few minutes ago, family photos, uh, family albums, those um, are something that I highly suggest that you keep around. Um, they can be points of conversation, points of sharing and those kinds of things. Although I will also share with you that my aunt, as she went through her dementia journey, even though she was in a nursing home, um, at some point, she was no longer able to recognize the picture of her husband. And at one point, she said this strange man was living in her room, and she didn't know what he was doing there. So I asked her where he was, and she went directly to his photo. And I know that she would have been very sad to know that I removed it, but I just took that photo home with me that day uh, because again, I did not want her to be distressed and upset that this strange man, even though she had lived with him for 40 years, um, was in her room. Um, another thing that you would that we suggest is to find different kinds of items in your home that can be an easy distraction when the person is feeling out of control. And I'm not talking about a cup of coffee. Uh, so think about other things that you can use in your home that might provide for um, comfort. So for example, can you turn on some music? Um, soft music usually is better than, again, something that makes that's loud. Um, you can use what my daughter calls elevator music uh, because that tends to be very soothing. Um, you might look at, again, not necessarily lighting a candle, but some type of aromatherapy. Um, anything that you can do to basically take uh, move from the point of frustration, whatever that might be, to a point of um, comfort or a place where people uh, feel safe. So some other tips, if you will, is one of the things that often causes confusion and difficulty is people can't find the remote to the television. Um, so put the remote on a cord or a string, put it in a stationary place so that it's always there and it doesn't get lost. Um, have easy access to cups and plates. Um, again, if the individual, if we want them to eat, we want them to drink. Um, so we need to have those things available, even if the individual is at a point where they are only using finger food, having access to these kinds of things, uh, to cups and plates, helps to uh, smooth that transition. If there are any types of preferences for blankets, for chairs, pillows, um, Anything, you know, the dog, if the, if the person loves the dog, if the dog can be around, anything that brings comfort, um, even when moving around the house, 
if those things are within easy sight and the person can latch onto those, that then helps to reduce the frustration and giving the person really free access um, to what those items so that they not only feel like they are in control and that they're independent, but at the same time that they can bring comfort and support. Try to prevent wondering as much as you can. Um, the very first thing when you um, have a diagnosis of dementia, we highly suggest that you go to the Alzheimer's um, website. There is a safe return home program and register your loved one with that program. It's a national um, database and can help to keep your loved one safe should they actually be able to get um, to leave the premises, even though you've done all kinds of things for their um, to improve your safety precautions. Um, <clears throat> another thing that can help with wondering is if there is regular companionship and some type of stimulating at activities that really um, reduce wondering. Again, you probably can't do this all alone. So looking to that support system that we talked about a few minutes ago and thinking about who can help with that. So our last slide then kind of in um, summary is the biggest thing in keeping someone home alone or home um, through a dementia journey is to keep them safe and to keep their frustrations low. So following daily routines that help to reduce confusion, scheduling activities when the person is more alert. So if the person is not as alert um, in the middle of the afternoon and it's more difficult for them to move around, try then to schedule things like a doctor's appointment or a walk around the block or reading um, books out loud, um, try to schedule those kinds of things when they're more alert and you know that they will enjoy them. Um, not so long ago, I was talking to the husband of a, a boss of mine and um, his wife had been a great, fairly accomplished pianist. And over the years, they had recorded many of her um, just at home um, piano playing um, times when she had played the piano, they had just recorded those. And so one of the things that he said they did every single morning is that he would play um, for at least an hour, even though he played the same songs mostly every day. Um, he would just play the piano music that she so enjoyed and that she played. And it was a great um, conversation thing. And then he said he would move to reading, um, reading to her. And he mostly read poetry or short stories, he said, again, because she enjoyed listening and he could then ask her questions about, you know, the dog or they could converse around it. So he said he, those two things really helped in his daily routine to be able to have some quality time with his wife, who was pretty far along in her dementia journey. Another thing to know is that you need to be patient. Um, all of these tasks are going to take longer than you expect. Um, so make sure that you allow extra time. If it normally took you 15 minutes to get to the doctor, allow 45 minutes because it's going to take some time to get oriented to go out into the car, to get into the car, to get the seatbelt on, to get yourself in, to find a place to park, to um, get the person out of the car, get out of the seatbelt, to get into the doctor's office. All of those things, which you might've been able to do previously in 15 minutes, may double or triple the time it takes. Um, so again, get, get your um, attitude and your mind set that these are the kinds of things that are going to happen. Um, try to give your loved one as much independence as possible, obviously in as a safe environment as possible. Encourage them to do as many things as they can by themselves. 
um, cue them as much as possible, whether you're writing like instructions and you know giving just what's in this I, in this drawer or whatever, or whether you are walking them through a bath or putting on their clothing or helping them with exercises, which might be, you know, some hand exercises or some stretching exercises in the chair. Naps are one of the worst enemies that you are going to find as your loved one goes through this dementia journey. Naps are easy to um, fall into when someone is sitting in a sedentary position. But what we also know from lots of study and research is that napping during the day really disrupts the sleep cycle. So being very aware of that and having alternatives that can avoid napping is extremely important. Um, one of the things you need to remember is that if your loved one's sleep cycle is disrupted, then your sleep cycle will also be disrupted and you are going to need as much um, support as the caregiver and as much rest and exercise as you can get during this journey. And lastly, always try to give people choices. Even if they're at the very end of their dementia journey, ask them if they want the red shirt or the white shirt. Ask them if they would like coffee or sugar in their coffee. Even if you know they want sugar in their coffee, ask them if they would like. It allows again for engagement it allows for their brain to um, work. It allows for conversation. And sometimes the most comforting thing that they can hear as they go through this journey is your voice. And once they no longer respond to your voice, then it will be extremely important that they're able to respond to um, touch and feel. So I'm going to finish off this afternoon with um, just a very brief overview of a couple of um, uh, highlights of CGS programs. Most of, or many of you know that we um, offer vision, hearing, and dental services. We have grants for those. We have a telephone buddy program. Um, we have had some success with people in early stage uh, dementia, having a telephone buddy call them. Um, on a once or twice a week basis and for them to be able to engage with the telephone buddy. So if you're early, if you're looking at this early in um, a dementia journey um, and you would like a, a telephone buddy, um, it's highly possible that we could find somebody who would be willing to work with your loved one. Um, advanced care planning, we have a robust set of counseling and toolkit services that are available as well as counseling and referral in a lot of different areas, including Medicare and Medicaid. Um, our housing and home care locator on our website, um, accompanied by our Colorado Senior Resource Guidebook, um, has information on health insurance, all types of housing for seniors that is licensed by the health department, um, as well as home care and hospice resources. And our health insurance literacy toolkit can help people to better understand health insurance. And lastly, we deliver holiday baskets in the Metro Denver area. We do a fair amount of work on housing and advocacy, um, just general advocacy on senior issues with the state legislature, as well as with the rulemaking process. And lastly, um, we do some education and information program, the series on aging in place. And we are going to be doing the Salute to Seniors again this year virtually on August the 12th and 13th from 11 to 1. Um, so look forward to receiving more information about that. And in the fall, we'll also be doing our Medicare Monday series on counseling and educational programming about changes for 2022. So thank you for your attention.